Hi, I'm Catherine Zarella, and I am live at New York Fashion Week, which kicked off this evening with the sophomore collection of Japanese designer Tomo Koizumi. Now, Tomo was discovered last season by stylist and editor Katie Grand, who was alerted to Tomo by Giles Deacon, uh, who had been tipped off via Instagram. And Tomo previously had been designing looks for pop stars, including Lady Gaga, who you may have heard of. Um, he, he was doing, and he continues to do, these, these big Japanese polyester, ruffled, colorful, rainbow-hued ensembles. And Katie Graham was so taken by his looks when she discovered them that she arranged a fashion show for him in New York at the Marc Jacobs Boutique uptown, backed by a gaggle of fashion superstars. So Pat McGrath did the makeup, Guido did the hair, Bella Hadid walked the show, Emily Ratajkowski walked the show, Gwendolyn Christie, the actress from Game of Thrones, you know her, closed the show. And as Gwendolyn closed the show, she walked down the grand staircase of the Marc Jacobs Boutique, kicking this very colorful, huge gown. It was so big that she was kicking it so she wouldn't trip on it. And I, I have to say, I've never been to a New York Fashion Week show where there was so much hollering and hooting and clapping and, and smiling as there was at Tomo's debut. And I think that that has to do with the fact that the New York fashion landscape is quite commercial. Um, and that's important. We need commercial clothing, you know, we need wearable clothing, we need accessible clothing, and that's what people buy. And we definitely have a handful of uh, young designers here who are doing, you know, presenting conceptual clothes and they're having important conversations through their clothes. But Tomo was something very different that we've not had in New York for a, a long time. And it's a certain sense of exuberance and excitement and I don't care fabulousness and color and happiness. And we, we really don't get a lot of that here. So I, I think that that contributed to, to the excitement of his first show. So he got a lot of press after that first show. And uh, obviously his sophomore collection was highly anticipated. A, because his first show was so well received, but also because I think people are wondering where he was going to go from there. So. The clothes that he presented his first season, you know, they were amazing to watch on the runway, but I don't know that there were a lot of real world applications. And from a commercial standpoint, for a young designer who's trying to build a brand, you have to think about the dream of the runway and also like where are you going to take that, you know, as far as how are you going to sell clothing and make a living. Um, and I think that people were interested to see whether or not he'd be able to transition what he did last season into something that was maybe more, uh, you know, able to translate into something that could be sold on the racks of department stores um, or, you know, websites, for instance. Uh, but uh, he he definitely did not disappoint with this collection. Um, last season, it was a very intimate show in the basement of the Marc Jacobs store. I sat on the carpet looking at this parade of supermodels, which was great. Uh, and this season, all three floors of the Marc Jacobs boutique were packed to the rafters and people were literally hanging over the railings of all of the floors in order to see the collection. And instead of having a gaggle of supermodels, as he did last season, um, he, Tomo worked with one model, uh, Arielle Nicholson, who Katie Graham recommended to him because uh, Katie's worked with her on the Mew Mew campaign and other scenarios. And also Katie told Tomo that um, Ariel was uh, uh, really great with movement and this show was all about performance and Ariel really knocked it out of the park in that respect um, and she wore all it was a very tightly edited collection and it was about seven looks and Ariel wore all the looks it was a bit like that Victor and Rolf show where they had Maggie Reiser and they were dressing her on stage and the beauty of the fact that we got to see Ariel like getting in and out of all of the looks is that you got to see the bones of this collection. You got to see, um, you know, kind of a, a bit of how it, it was made and how it came together. And, you know, for 
you can be as outrageous as you want, but if the clothes aren't made well, like what what's the point? Like where are you going from there? And these clothes, like Tomo has a particular vision and he executes it to perfection, which is really impressive. Um, these clothes are really beautifully made. So it was great watching her get in and out of these looks and all of which were very outrageous. And the outrageousness of the looks was amplified by the beauty look. So Guido did this hair and it was like the hair from those troll dolls from the 90s that kind of came up to a point. The troll dolls that had the little jewel in their tummy. And Pat McGrath did the makeup and uh, it was it was kind of like a shimmery situation and there's a lot of pink around the eyes and it, it was almost like an otherworldly, you know, alien, uh, she, she looked like a, like a, like an old Hollywood doyenne if she were on acid. And uh, obviously the clothes were a big part of that in addition to the makeup. So each look, you know, Tomo continued with his ruffled Japanese polyester, but this season, the looks were a bit more mature as opposed to last season. They were a bit more girly. They were more flirty. They were a little more playful. This season they were, it was kind of, they were full gowns, all of them, like to the ground, massive. And there was an erotic element to them because every time that Ariel was put into a look, she'd get this look of ecstasy on her face. And it, it, it was, it was something of a, you know, she, she would look discontented when her, she, you know, she wasn't in a look and then she'd have the gown placed on her and it was, it was an absolute look of ecstasy. And I think that it spoke to the, you know, the power that, that clothing can have and the, the emotional factor of clothing. Um, and each look this season was inspired by a character that Tomo created in his mind. So one of the looks was uh, about water. And when Ariel had that look on, she kind of wafted around the uh, her space, you know, as if she were a wave. But another look was inspired by bubbles. So she, she was a bit more effervescent when she was wearing that. Um, I don't know the themes behind all of the looks, but one of them was like a bird of paradise. It was purple and pink and down to the ground and ruffles out to here. And the sleeves were like this and Ariel would flap her arms as if she were flying. And there's another look that was all black ruffles and Ariel rolled around on the floor and she looked like a possessed black swan. And it was, it was disturbing, but also just completely fantastic. Um, and I wanted to be that possessed black swan. There was another look that it was, it was kind of a play on the classic haute couture bride. And uh, uh, it was a big white look and Ariel put the veil over her cone, uh, you know, troll doll hairdo. And there were a lot of oohs and ahs from the audience at that point. Um, so, you know, it was definitely an evolution from what Tomo did last season, uh, but still in the same vein, which left me and a lot of others questioning, where is he going from here? And when I asked Tomo that question, he told me that he's, he's not sure what he wants to do in the ready to wear realm. Uh, he's figuring it out. I think that's fair. I don't think it's, it's great that the press rushes young designers. I think there, it's so often that we give designers the spotlight and then we push them so hard and they burn out. I think that Tomo should take all the time that he needs to figure out where he wants to go with his collection. Um, but what he did say is that he's really interested in collaborating with other brands and Last season, he did a collaboration with Marc Jacobs and he took a bunch of old Marc Jacobs t-shirts and uh, put the kind of, his kind of signature ruffles on the sleeves. So he gave these old t-shirts a new life, um, and uh, which is a big conversation that's happening in fashion right now with upcycling. And uh, he made them accessible to the fashion consumer. He made his vision and his brand accessible and relatable. I think that was incredibly smart. So... I hope he does something like that going forward. 
Um, and you know, then the runway dresses are the dream and they're selling these t-shirts or whatever he decides to do next. He also told me he's interested in participating in the LVMH prize next year. And I think that that would give him fantastic exposure. Um, but you know, as far as this particular collection, he also told me that he felt so embraced by the fashion community and by the New York fashion community in particular last season that this, he wanted this collection to be his gift to them and his gift to the world. And it was a really joyous, lovely experience to see the show. And I have to say on the, the gray, rainy, miserable first day of New York Fashion Week, to have this be the first thing that I saw was, um, very uplifting and I'm I'm very excited and hopeful for Tomo to see where he takes his brand but uh, you know for the time being I think he's a very important injection of creativity and ostentation and excitement into New York Fashion Week and I'll see you tomorrow